All right, folks. Well, let's just dive right into it, I think. Uh, biology, chemistry, and history. Sometimes you can't get all the good things in life all in one place, but with insect galls, it is possible to get all those great things all in one nice little bundle. And uh, thank you again, Weedon Island, for putting this on for me. It's been a long time since I've gotten to talk about galls, but I am super excited. It's a great love affair of mine, so let's get going. We're gonna cover a variety of topics today, but it all they boil down to a few basic questions. What are they? What do they do? And how have galls and humans gotten along historically? Um, first of all, let's cover what a gall is. Basic answer, it's part of the plant. But the, blueprint, the blueprints for the gall are actually given to the plant by a bug. Also, sometimes by fungus, but we'll cover bugs today. So all galls are made of primarily host plant tissue. They can either be simple swellings of tissue or they can be complex structures with lots of specialized features. Um, their main function though is to provide protection and food for the larvae developing inside. You can see up in this corner here um, that there can be multiple larvae within one gall or perhaps only one larva within each one. Um, now, how do they make these galls? It can get a little tricky, but essentially these insects, and it's a wide variety of them, uh, instruct the plant on how to make a gall through genetic manipulation. Uh, this includes injecting chemical stimulants or physical stim or uh, later applying physical stimulants to the plant that actually redirects growth such that it produces some kind of structure that provides really tasty tissue for all of the larvae to eat, and usually a hard outer layer that protects those uh, larvae from both the elements and predators. Just as a really quick, simple anatomy lesson on a gall, there's really three basic layers. This first layer on the outside here is nutritive tissue for the most part. And nutritive tissue just means that it's food for the larva. Uh, it's usually got lots of water, it's got lots of sugar, um, but as it develops, as the larva starts to develop and starts to move towards becoming a pupa, which is where it would then turn into an adult, the lignin content in that outer layer increases and that lignin is just a molecule that increases the toughness of that gall. And so the function switches from nutritive, nutritive tissue to protection. And they can be quite tough and woody, uh, especially if you find certain species out in uh, the scrubby habitats around here, these galls are almost impenetrable. Now you go one more layer in and this kernel wall, is actually very, very important for the developing pupa. It does not really develop while the larva is still around because that it would in, in, uh, inhibit uh, feeding on the nutritive tissue. But the kernel wall, once it does develop around the pupa, uh, it actually is almost airtight. It prevents moisture loss. And so the, the pupa does not dehydrate while it is uh, developing into an adult, you can almost think of a kernel as a chrysalis or a cocoon. It serves many of the same purposes, but it is a bit tougher. Uh, it's a bit harder and it serves more of a protective function as well. And finally, you get down to the larva and the pupa. Now, depending on what kind of gall you're looking at, you might find a larva that's quite small or quite large. And by large, I do mean, uh, about the size of a rice grain. That's as big as you're going to find out there. Uh, the smallest are not even visible with your naked eye. So depending on what you're looking at, you may find different things, but this is the basic layout of an insect gall on a plant. 
Now there are lots of things out there on plants that are caused by bugs. And so you might be wondering, where's the distinction between what is a gall and what isn't a gall? Basically, so long as there is no structure produced by the plant that is uh, induced by a bug, <laughs> uh, it is not a gall. So a good example of this are the leaf miner uh, trails left on leaves uh, from little leaf miners. They are not a gall, but they are uh, a, a marking left on a plant, not a structure though. Uh, leaf rollers, they might manipulate the plant, but they don't actually cause any extra growth. Um, the trickiest one though is these Kermes scales down here. You find these on oak trees a lot, especially down here in uh, the southeast, and they look just like a gall. They really do. They'll trick uh, even pretty experienced gall hunters out there, but it's actually a very weird little bug whose females, gravid or pregnant females, uh, are sucking the tasty juices out of the plant and raising her babies within her inflated body cavity, uh, which will then eventually burst out and the cycle starts all over again. So really cool bug, but not a gall. But let's dive into the galls that you guys might see while you're out walking at Whedon Island. Uh, Whedon Island has lots of different plants that could provide really cool gall hunting uh, uh, opportunities. And one of the first ones you might see are these midge galls. Uh, this Polystepha genus of midges really loves to go after scrub oaks. So your myrtle oaks, your Chapman oaks, your, your sand live oaks, very common out there in those scrubby type of habitats. Uh, and this is a really classic midge gall on oaks. But midges aren't uh, too picky. They will actually go after lots of different plants. Um, different species of the midges will go after different species of plants. And so on this screen, you can see examples of a few of those that includes uh, bald cypress, goldenrod, grapevines, and they all have very different structures. So while these are closely related midges, they have very different strategies depending on which plant they go after. And that's a pattern you'll see throughout uh, all of these examples as well. Aphid galls are not as common as midges, but they're still really cool. And you will see them around here. And I encourage you to break a couple open when you find them because you'll see this very interesting uh, phenomenon that they do. Well, not phenomenon, but uh, it's a very practical yet odd <laughs> uh, strategy. They will produce this powdery substance, as you can see in this upper left-hand photo with the cross-section of the black poplar gall. Uh, that is the, uh, the developing nymph inside the gall, and this is its poop. So it actually uh, poops out liquid. Uh, it's feeding on sap and nectar and things like that. Uh, that it's getting right from the plant. And so its poop is going to be equally liquidy. And it would drown in its own poop if it didn't produce this very uh, uh, waxy powder that actually isolates that poop into little droplets that the, the bug can then maneuver around. Um, and so you'll see these guys doing that on black popular, poplar. You'll see it on a lot of hickory species around here although we don't have a ton of hickory in Pinellas County. Uh, you can see some of it though. Uh, and then on some other species, they use the same kind of powdery kind of looking substance, but it's more as a deterrent from predators. Makes physical space between a predator and the feeding nymph. The jumping plant lice uh, do something very similar where they have to <laughs> prevent themselves from drowning in their own waste. And so they will produce the same kind of powdery substance, especially in the galls that you see on our bay species around here. Bay is a very common, both upland and wetland plant that you will see at Whedon Island. And if you were actually to break one of these open, you'd be able to see these tiny little feeding nymphs. And they are the ones that are inducing the growth of this gall. Uh, they'll eventually turn into the adult. And uh, this is one of the only galls out there uh, that I actually see making a harmful 
a substantial harmful impact on their host plant. They, they can get quite aggressive, um, but I've never seen a, a bay tree die from it. Um, Yapon holly, very common species of ornamental and uh, native plant around here. And they get a very similar species of jumping plant lice, as well as hackberry species. I've seen these down at, um, I'm gonna forget the name for a little bit, but I've seen them here in Pinellas County. And uh, they're very hard, very tough. You can't even get into that without getting a um, garden shears out to break it open. So very tough for predators to get into. Mite galls, uh, very common this time of year. Uh, you will see it on lots of poison ivy, lots of willow, uh, elm, things like that. These guys are so small, you're not gonna see the actual bug making the gall. You're only going to see the gall. Um, with the aculop species of mite, you'll often see them being a, a red color, so they're kind of easy to point out or to spot. Um, but with others, it's just a tube-like, very small uh, little gall on either the underside or top side of the plant. And so they're actually quite easy to miss. Uh, but they're very common in the spring and early summer season down here. Now, to get into wasp galls, uh, these are the uh, galls that I love the most just because of their amazing morphological variations in, in their structure. Uh, they can produce the most amazing structures of galls that have very, very specific purposes. And we'll go over a few. Um, and then I'll, I'll also tell you guys about some of the species you're likely to see when you're out walking uh, pretty much in any scrubby or dry area of Florida. So who makes these wasp galls? Well, this little lady right here is a very good example of what a gall wasp looks like. She is in the family Cynipidae or Cynipidae, depending on how you like to pronounce it. Um, people often just refer to them as cynipids. A uh, pretty diverse uh, uh, family of wasps, over a thousand species worldwide. At least 66 of those are here in Florida. And when I say at least, you know, that estimate was from 2004. Especially here in Florida. Um, and so that number might to say, because as we'll get into later, the, the taxonomy can get a little wonky, as taxonomy often does. But you will find uh, these gall wasps creating galls on mostly oak species, uh, species in the genus Quercus. Uh, you'll see some on rose species, some blackberry species, even smilax, but the vast majority are on oak species. And generally, they have two generations a year that look very different from each other. And we'll go into that in a little bit. So let's start off with some of our common galling species. Oak apple gall, or Amphibolops murata. Now, I'm going to go mostly by scientific name here because there just aren't uh, common names for these guys around. Uh, feel free to come up with your own. But uh, Amphibolops is a very common genus that you'll find on especially myrtle oaks. Uh, you'll find some on laurel oaks as well. But whenever you're in a scrub and you see some myrtle oaks around, take a look. You'll probably find a few of these, at least older brown ones. So when a gall is fresh and the larva is still inside and developing, it's going to be nice and green because it's still providing nutrition for that larva. But when it's older and either the larva is now pupating or it's already left the gall, you're going to see old and brown dry, uh, it could be hard, it could be papery, it could be dense, it could be light, depends on the species, but this is what it looks like older, this is what it looks like fresher, with a really nice cross section going right through it, so you can see how the actual kernel is suspended within the gall, and this is actually to make it harder for predators to reach the kernel. So that's one of the specializations of the amphibolips genus. You don't see that in others. Antricus quercus foliatus, uh, one of my favorite words to say, quercus foliatus. 
Uh, it actually does mean leafy oak gall. And this is absolutely one of my favorite galls because it actually was the first one I knew to be a gall. I was in undergrad down at Little Manatee River State Park and I found something that looked very weird on an oak tree. And I asked my professor what it was and he rightly so just thought it was the flower of the oak. Uh, but lo and behold, I, I keep looking into it and I find out that it's hiding a little, little wasp and that the wasp is a parasite on the tree. And uh, there's all these special structures on the gall that protects the, the wasp from the elements or predators. And what's even cooler about this one in particular is it looks like an oak flower because it's actually developing on the oak's flower bud tissue. So depending on where the gall is forming, it will have different characteristics that are related to what organ of the plant would have developed otherwise. And so this guy it develops in the bud tissue and looks a lot like an overgrown oak flower. Uh, green when it's fresh and brown when it's dry. And you can see that tiny little ant-sized wasp just coming out. And uh, for anybody who's wondering, no, they cannot sting, <laughs> which made my uh, experiences with them much better, of course. Uh, but even if they could sting, they're so small that they probably wouldn't uh, hurt you at all. Another species within that same genus, Andricus quercus lanigera, uh, often only found on live oak and sand live oak. I just think these are adorable because they're these tiny little kernels. Uh, this is a fully mature kernel that usually develops along the underside of the midrib of the leaf. And as a defensive mechanism, they cover themselves with hair, uh, obviously not animal hair, but with tiny filaments that resemble hair that actually makes it harder for the predators to get into the kernel. And uh, they're quite soft, they're quite fun to play with if you do find these out in, uh, in the wild or on your tree in the backyard. Again, with the andricus, this is Quercus petiolicola, <laughs> named so because it does develop all along the petiole, the leaf stem of the leaf. Uh, usually, I find these on Chapman's oak, but they do uh, uh, parasitize a, a large host of different uh, oak species. And so sometimes it's really helpful to learn your oak species and that helps you identify the gall, but then other times it's not really gonna help you out that much. So in this case, this is a pretty wide ranging species of gall wasp and uh, you'll find it on a variety of oaks. This one's really common uh, on sand live oak, especially, I don't see it much on live oak, but when I'm walking through a scrub, I will often see this Bellinoctoma quercus virens uh, just taking over these very small shrubby sand live oaks. And I always wonder exactly how much resources are being taken from the tree, but at the same time, I never see a dead tree covered in these galls. So the jury's still out on how harmful these can be, but you'll often see them in large numbers when you do see them. And these guys rely on uh, the strategy of just producing a lot of babies as opposed to making a really tough gall. These, are, these galls are very soft, very easy to get into, very often parasitized by other wasps, um, but they produce a lot of them. So that's how they generally uh, keep their populations up. Oak apple gall, Dishelcaspis quercus omnivora. One of my real favorites, they can be absolutely gorgeous when they are uh, still fresh with shades of yellow and red uh, that do eventually fade into brown. You can actually see in this picture here how there is an exit hole still left in the gall. And you'll see that oftentimes on galls you see out when you're walking, um, a lot of the old galls will have the exit holes still chewed into them. And that actually leaves them open for other critters to then live inside that gall. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's usually a good idea to check to see if the gall is open, is empty or not before taking them from your tree in the backyard for use for other things, which again, we'll talk about later. 
All right, Dishal Caspis Quercus spongiosa. Uh, or Dishal Caspis spongiosa, the bar is keeping me from reading it. Oh, well. Uh, really cool gall. I very rarely see this. And so uh, this I really just included because it is so cool. These galls can get over three inches around. They're quite soft, quite um, spongy, surprisingly spongy. And uh, it can just be very, very light and corky and um, gives you a really great insight into gall anatomy, as you guys saw in my slide about um, the different types of tissue that you see in a gall. And they can have multiple kernels per gall. That is a trait of some species. And so always uh, keep that in mind. If you see a gall, it might have more than one wasp in it. All right, I need to get rid of this top bar here because I cannot see the species name anymore. <laughs> oh, well. So for you this might be able to move the bar if you need to, Christine. Ah, thank Drag you, Stephanie. Drop. Ah, Stephanie comes to the rescue. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a little while since I've done Zoom, but I know all of you will uh, bear with me through it. So Caloritis quercus batatoides, uh, another really fun name. Really common, and I know I've said that for most of these guys, but they, this really is very common, especially in our live oaks that we have in our yards and in our parks. Um, it looks very similar to another species on, uh, on uh, myrtle oaks and laurel oaks and, and others called Eumeria floridana. So this is a species where you're not really going to be able to identify it unless you know what kind of oak you're looking at. And IDing oaks can be very, very frustrating, <laughs> but it can be really worth the, the challenge. Um, if you are looking at a live oak, you know that you're looking at the Caloritis orcus batatoides. You're looking at a laurel oak. You're looking at Eumeria floridana. And I'm sure there are other species out there that would prove me wrong with that statement, but that's generally the uh, species you'll see around here. Uh, these are really simple galls, not a lot of complexity with them. It's mostly just swollen tissue that's really tasty for the larvae to eat. Uh, it's very dense because it's really just stem tissue. Uh, and so it's hard for predators to crack into, but I've definitely seen uh, probably squirrels uh, having taken bites out of these and slurping out the uh, nice protein pockets inside. Um, but that's a really cool gall with multiple larvae within them. Trigonaspis polita has got to be the most beautiful gall out there. I mean, who doesn't want to put that on a Christmas wreath? Uh, often called the oak apple gall. It's really only found on Chapman's oak around here. We don't have post oak within Pinellas County that I know of, but we have lots of Chapman's oak. Uh, and when these guys are ripe and ready to go, you will definitely be able to see them easily because they're so bright and beautiful and are often anchored on the tops of the leaf, but not all the time, uh, usually right out of the mid vein where they get lots of circulation of nice sugary fluids. And so uh, uh, they can get about the size of a quarter. Very nice doll. Okay, and our second to last slide on the different species of gall wasps that you'll see around here is another one where it depends on which species of oak you're looking at. Uh, these two neuroterra species, whether it's Quercus minutissimus or Quercus verucarum, uh, they look very, very similar, and they grow in very similar spots on the leaf. But if you know whether you're looking at a sand live oak or a live oak or a dwarf live oak, I don't have a lot of dwarf live oak, but uh, that's usually the, or well, that's always the Quercus minutissimus species. But if you're looking at something like post oak or Chapman's oak or a white oak, then you're looking at the Quercus vericarum species. Um, and Depending on the age of the skull, they might be brown, they might be white, they might be pink, which is quite fun. Uh, uh, I always find myself looking under oak leaves whenever I pass by a nice little oak. So our last species to talk about uh, is one of the few that we know their 
a whole reproductive cycle up. So this is Dishel caspis quercus virens, uh, probably hands down my favorite gall because of how much we know about them. And they're very common, very common in Pinellas County and even in very urban settings. Uh, these wasps do pretty well living with us. They do something called cyclical parthenogenesis. And that basically means that they go through a cycle of sexual and asexual reproduction every single year. So in the winter time, you will have the asexual females emerging from, the, from their galls. These asexual females are capable of producing viable offspring without the need for uh, sexual reproduction. And they produce this tiny, tiny rice grain sized gall uh, that over summers, instead of over winters, it over summers in these little crevices on the on the uh, the bud tissue of their host tree, which is usually a sand live oak or a live oak. Very inconspicuous gall, very hard to find if you're a gall hunter, which is why uh, these guys down here evaded our attention for so long. Uh, these wonderful researchers on this paper that I quoted up here were finally able to uh, um, isolate these summer galls to the point where they were able to hatch out these sexual females and sexual males uh, to produce a sexual, uh, to, to, um, that resulted in sexual reproduction of the winter gall and developing within the winter gall here is the asexual female. And so as the year goes on, you have this cycle going over and over every year. And it's assumed that this cycle is similar to what every other gall wasp does, but we don't know. Uh, that's one of the cool things about gall wasps is there's still a lot of mystery out there uh, we know only one generation, either the sexual or asexual, of most gall wasps. Um, so we could be calling two different species the same thing on accident or vice versa. Um, you really have to do genetic analysis on these. And there's not a lot of geneticists out there who are wanting to go out into the field to uh, uh, collect uh, oak galls, but, you know, I'll do it for them if they want. But uh, this is the best example we have of how gall wasps actually reproduce. Um, it's quite complicated, but it does have really practical um, underpinnings. In the winter, when the asexual female emerges, there's not a lot of resources out there. She doesn't have time or energy to try to find a mate uh, in, in that short period of time that she's alive outside of the gall. I did forget to mention earlier, these galls do not, or these wasps do not feed once they're adults. So once they emerge from the gall, the clock is ticking. Uh, she's got to find a good place to lay her eggs and she's got to do it quick. So there's no time for finding a male. Therefore, she has been able to evolve the capability of essentially creating clones of herself. And those clones grow up in the summer gall throughout the summer. And then in the fall, they hatch out. There's lots more resources here in the fall. You've just gotten through the rainy summer of Florida. There's lots more fresh growth. It's not as dry. Uh, the temperatures are starting to be a little more mild. So these guys can take their time and they can get that good uh, uh, diversification of genes that comes with sexual reproduction. And then they can go on, create this winter gall, which is a uh, really tough, really hard, uh, about the uh, bigger than a pencil eraser and often found in clumps on the stem, uh, which then produces the asexual female in the next uh, winter time and the cycle just keeps going. Uh, it's quite a practical um, survival strategy, if maybe a little complicated. So let's get into who is a threat for these guys. Why do they have galls that are so um, so good at deterring predators? Uh, well, there's actually a lot of things that try to eat these guys. You can imagine that if you have 
a um, a little protein pocket just sitting inside a plant stationary, uh, it's probably going to be pretty tempting for predators to come up and try to find a way to get it. Now, one of the not too serious predators or inquilines uh, are different wasps and a couple of moths. You can actually see the Florida oak gall moth photo right here and a uh, developing one that I found myself with all the frass it had just eaten. Uh, all the inside of the gall. We're not sure if these moths actually destroy the uh, developing larva or just can eat any gall. We're not entirely sure, but all of this is poop and this is the developing pupa of the moth and it's going to make this beautiful moth uh, about the size of uh, uh, your thumbnail. And they are one source of mortality for galls, but not too common and only on specific uh, gall species. These other uh, uh, wasps within the Synergeny tribe aren't really a threat, but they will be parasites within the galls. So it's a wasp parasitizing a wasp that is parasitizing a plant, which is great. <laughs> and uh, to go one step further with that, there are parasitoids. A parasitoid refers to anything that is a parasite, but at the same time kills its host. Usually only needs one host, but it always kills it. So these parasitoids are wasps that are very closely related to the gall wasps themselves, but they've lost the ability to make their own galls. So instead they are parasitoids of gall wasps. Really cool example, example of that is Euderus set or the crypt keeper wasp. This is actually a really cool image of uh, one of these parasitoid wasps drilling into the gall of another wasp and depositing an egg likely right next to the larvae of the uh, other wa of the gall wasp or within it, depending on the strategy. Now there will also be just classic predators of these galls. Uh, as you can see here, they are not impenetrable. Uh, birds, small mammals can chew into them, get that little meat pocket in there. And then a newly discovered interaction, we don't know if it's significant or not, is that love vine, uh, a, a native parasitic plant, actually can suck the life out of a gall if it attaches correctly. Uh, you don't see this often, but it is a really cool plant on bug on plant interaction. <laughs> So on Eudera set, the crypt keeper gall, or the crypt keeper wasp, excuse me, uh, will often go after uh, uh, stem galling wasps. So here we have the stem galling wasp larvae developing within its little gall. And Eudera set comes in, lays an egg right next to that larva. Well, that uh, uh, injection of an egg includes injection of a mind controlling cocktail of hormones and chemicals. And that cocktail actually directs the now grown gall wasp. So this is the gall wasp that has emerged from its pupa. It is now for some reason directed uh, uh, internally to dig a hole out to the open world, out from the gall, make it just a little too small. It actually gets stuck in the hole. Now, when Euderus set is ready to emerge, it actually burrows through the gall wasp's body, not eating it most likely, but burrows through and just leaves the hole of its host <laughs> uh, stuck in that gall for the, for the remainder of its uh, time. And uh, surprisingly enough, this is not the only species uh, uh, of crypt keeper wasp that does something this uh, graphic, <laughs> this uh, uh, intense to multiple different species of gall wasps. There's uh, a lot of species out there that we just don't know about, uh, but this is definitely one of the coolest that we do know about. Now, uh, Galls, when they remain on the tree, 
can actually be really important resources for other critters in that habitat, uh, especially the galls that are very hard, very tough, very hard to break into. Ants just go nuts for these galls for a couple different reasons. One of them is they can actually live inside those galls. In my time uh, doing field work, hunting for these galls, uh, I would often break them open and a little colony of ants would be very annoyed with me for having opened up their home. And uh, they can actually dig out these burrows within the gall and create different chambers within the gall for different uses. And so it's just like a little ant mound, but it's all within this small marble sized gall. Um, and that's similar to what spiders and moths and beetles can do, but usually uh, spiders, moths, beetles don't really change the structure of the gall. They just live within it once the uh, wasp has already left. Now, there's also really cool interactions between ants, galls, and the host plant. Uh, I tend to always think of galls as purely parasitic on the plant, but in some instances, it actually can help the host plant at the same time. And a good example of this, this is a gall, these little kernels that are emerging from this uh, oak stem are Calaritis quercus gemaria, um, which is a not a very common gall species, but really cool. And what it's doing is it's secreting nectar through the top of the kernel. And that's purposefully to attract ants. And those ants help the gall by keeping predators away. But we've also found that the presence of those ants on that tree actually reduces insect herbivory on that tree. It reduces how much, uh, how many pests that tree has. And so you could definitely make the argument in this scenario and probably several others, that it's more of a mutualistic relationship between the gall, the ant, and the tree. Uh, so it can get a little more complicated than simple parasitism. Now, what about us and galls? We've talked about how galls interact with their habitats and the other critters within their habitats, but what about people? Believe it or not, we've been using galls for thousands of years, thousands of years. Uh, uh, the term gall in English refer refers to bitterness of spirit or rancor. And that is uh, uh, connected to the plant gall, the noun gall, uh, because galls are full of tannic acid. Tannic acid is a very bitter astringent compound or group of compounds that is also responsible for making tea and coffee and wine bitter. Um, so think of that concentrated, if you pop that in your mouth, you're definitely going to think that it's pretty bitter and gall is probably a good word to describe it. Now, galls have these high, high levels of tannic acids because one of their main mortality, uh, um, one of the main sources of mortality is fungal infections. So if you get a fungal infection within a gall, it's probably going to hit pretty hard and it's probably going to reduce how many um, uh, galling insects can emerge from that gall or kill it altogether. And so the tannic acid is a very important part of the gall, but us humans have been able to make it a very important part of different industries. Uh, we've been using uh, galls for creating dyes and tanning leather for a long time, even primitive medicines that require some kind of astringent element to it, like very simple wound care. But most importantly, arguably, is iron gall ink. Uh, it is the first permanent ink that we have recorded that we've ever made. I'm not going to say that there wasn't anything else out there that was permanent, uh, but this is the first one that we know of that was absolutely permanent. All other inks before that, before the first century, were carbon-based. Very easy to make, but very easy to smudge, just like our modern-day graphite pencils. Uh, and so we actually really relied on this permanent gall ink for hundreds and hundreds of years up until the 1930s. Um, 
it's a really simple recipe too. I mean, people were doing this at home. It was a little cottage industry where you didn't need a lot of supplies. You didn't need anything super hard to get your hands on. You basically just needed galls, ferrous sulfate, which is a byproduct of iron ore mining. And the same thing that we actually treat iron deficiency anemia today, so it's perfectly food safe. And after just a little bit of preparation, you get a permanent ink that we actually use to write the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, uh, uh, all sorts of really important documents that, they, you know, it's pretty important that they stay permanent, that they can't just be erased. Uh, so we have Gauls to thank for a lot of our written history. And if anybody is interested, it is, like I said, very easy to make. Uh, towards the end of this presentation, I'll go ahead and put this up on the screen so people can write it down if you'd like, but I'll go over it very quick. All you need is distilled water. The distilled part's pretty important. You need oak galls. Uh, definitely don't collect from Whedon Island or any other preserves. You should only get your galls from uh, your own trees or maybe your neighbor's trees, but don't, co don't collect from public lands. Uh, and then iron sulfate and gum arabic, both very easy to get on Amazon or things like that. And both, both food safe. Gum arabic is in pretty much every candy out there. So fun to do with kids. You can crush up the galls with a hammer. Always cool, cool for a, a group project. Uh, basically put them in a jar with some distilled water and let it ferment for three days. That fermentation process increases the tannic acid level. The tannic acid is not the dye in this situation. The tannic acid is the binder. So without that tannic acid, it wouldn't be permanent. It's actually the iron sulfate that is the dye, is the color of the dye. Um, and you'll add that after you've fermented it for three days and strained everything out. And then basically you just use gum arabic to thicken it up and uh, get it to whatever consistency you need. Uh, keep it in the refrigerator for up to six months, but left out in the open, it can actually get a little moldy. Uh, so, you know, use it to, uh, to your desire. These are two really cool examples of uh, how we've used gall ink in the past. Uh, Germany on the left-hand side, actually used iron gall ink as its official government ink until the 80s. Unfortunately, as you can see on the right-hand side, there's a downside. Uh, after several hundred years, uh, the ink actually starts to eat away at the paper. And that's because all those tannic acids within the ink are acidic and start to eat away at the substrate that you actually wrote it on. Um, that actually is a big problem for historians and people who work with conserving important documents. Um, I mean, anybody who's scrapbooks probably knows the dangers of acidic ink, and this is uh, one of the first examples of it. Uh, but still a really cool tool that we've used, like I said, since Roman times. Pliny the Elder first wrote about uh, using iron gall ink on papyrus paper. So just as a little recap, uh, hopefully I didn't go too quickly through all this, but we can always revisit any topics you want. Uh, lots of different insects can induce galls on plants. Um, they are a very, the galls themselves are a very important part of their ecosystems, even if they're hard for us to see on a daily basis, they actually do provide a lot of services for their different habitats. Uh, gall wasps are pretty rad <laughs> for different reasons. Uh, the family is incredibly diverse. They have super cool, complex life cycles, and they support a ton of other species at the same time, uh, whether it is their parasitoid predators or um, other critters that tend to munch on them. And finally, humans and oak galls were a match made in history. I mean, we've uh, been using them for thousands of years, and you can still use them today, but it's more for fun than for actual business. Mm -hmm.